So Dr. Lisa Quinn is from the University of Leicester and she's going to talk to us today about integrating multi-source inputs into pre-recorded and remote live lectures. So over to you Lisa. Uh, I'm just going to turn my uh, video off and go straight to show my slides. Uh, um, just to clarify, everybody can see my slides okay? Yes we can, yeah. Uh, wonderful. Um, yeah, so well, first of all, uh, just thank you very much for the opportunity to come and uh, speak this uh, this morning. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, as Phil said, my name's uh, Dr Quinn Lisa. I'm a lecturer at Leicester Medical School. Um, and, and really, over the next sort of 10 minutes or so, what I'd like to do is uh, just share an approach that uh, I took to developing much of my asynchronous or the pre-recorded tutorials and lectures um, over the last 12 months uh, in response to um, obviously what we've been dealing with. Um, but much, much of what I did in regards to developing my asynchronous materials would uh, equally be feasible uh, if, if giving something synchronously or, or live sort of teaching uh, delivery. Um, and this, of course, was, was in the context of, of, uh, of having to make, as for many, a very rapid shift to working from home and finding ways to delivering what were originally face to face uh, activities uh, done remotely. So. Um, just to, to sort of set what, what I teach, uh, so I teach a lot of anatomy, I teach uh, medical students uh, and as you can appreciate anatomy is a very visual uh, subject um, and it involves actually developing a, a three dimensional understanding of the subject in terms of orientations and relationships um, and pedagogically if you want to encourage and support students to think in that manner, I think it's important that uh, you, you, you teach and you, you, you deliver the content uh, in that manner. So normally um, pre-COVID I teach through uh, interactive lectures, uh, doing things to hopefully encourage students to uh, engage in a more active process with, uh, with, with what I was doing. But that will be supplemented by uh, hands on practicals with anatomical models and, and dissection. Um, but obviously in the last uh, uh, year with restrictions uh, with regards to COVID, um, the hands on practicals and dissections were, were no longer possible. And so there was much more importance placed on uh, doing things through my interactive lectures, whether that be synchronous or asynchronous, to really highlight the importance of, of these three dimensional orientations and relationships. Um, but like, like many, um, obviously teaching from home, um, I didn't have particular te technical expertise in creating and editing videos and I had uh, just the sort of very basics of, uh, of equipment uh, to, to start to pull uh, some of my, uh, my teaching sessions together. So with that in mind, um, and, and just perhaps maybe sort of setting context in terms of what I was used to. Uh, this is our lecture theatre uh, at the medical school. Um, here we have uh, two separate projectors which means we can project uh, sort of two inputs uh, into uh, or in parallel when I was teaching. Uh, if I zoom in just to where the lectern is um, and just show you what, what tools I'd normally have available is I could have my slides here sent to one projector, maybe presenting some images. Uh, I could have a visualizer, I could connect my iPad and then I had this little touch screen here which I could um, alter the inputs to the different projectors. Um, so normally what I'd be working with when I was doing my interactive lectures is that I could present my slides uh, here and then my secondary input uh, would be, for example, demonstrating some of the relationships uh, of the anatomy in a more three dimensional um, uh, perspective. So this is a model here of the cartilages. The other thing that I do is that um, to increase that sort of interactivity and engagement through my lectures is that we would live annotate and draw onto uh, things that were missing on the slides that I would send to the students. Uh, and and in pre-COVID times in the normal lecture theatre what I'd do is I, I would I would put my iPad underneath the visualiser because it was just quicker than trying to sort of switch the inputs uh, through the projector. Um, so obviously moving out from the lecture theatre to <laughs> my home uh, office uh, I wanted to find a, a really sort of cheap and, and easy way of 
replicating that ability to bring multiple sources uh, into into my teaching activities, uh, whether that be synchronous or asynchronous. Um, for the most part, this is what I did for a lot of my asynchronous uh, activities, in, in part because of the platform that, that the university had uh, stipulated that we use for our uh, synchronous teaching. So I wanted to be able to bring in uh, PowerPoint slides. I wanted to be able to bring in my iPad and, and use my iPad as a as an interactive sort of whiteboard uh, if I was wanting to do sort of chalk and talk uh, type activities or annotation, fill in the boxes, drawing uh, images and that sort of thing. And at the same time, I wanted to also bring in, you know, the talking head, ensure that, you know, I was bringing a humanistic element to a lot of those asynchronous lectures that they could actually see I was a person that had a face or wasn't just a, a voice behind the scene. Um, and also the, the use of a visualizer, uh, because I did, I'd used that a lot in my sessions. So this is my my, my office, uh, my desk. I, I did tidy it up for this picture, um, but you can see I've just got a second monitor, laptop, webcam, a phone, um, and I wanted to, to use what I had basically to try and replicate what I had in the lecture theater. Uh, and obviously I've got an iPad as well. Um, so <clears throat> not, you know, nothing uh, last shattering here. Uh, I just decided to use uh, Zoom, the basic account, free account. Uh, so this didn't cost me anything. Um, and I would record through Zoom. Um, and uh, because Zoom gives you the option to share screen, I could very quickly bring different inputs that I had sort of set up in the background onto the screen uh, while I was recording. So that meant I could bring in uh, all the things I wanted to bring in. I could share my slides. I could switch to a full talking head or just a small window and I could connect through uh, again through share screen things that was being shown on my iPad. For setting up a visualizer I actually used my, my phone and um, I purchased it. This was the only thing that cost me which was uh, I purchased an app called iDoc Cam which was uh, £10 for the year um, and together I was able to create a visualizer input from, from that and I'll touch a little bit further on that in a second. Within Zoom, I would go into my own Zoom room, I would lock it so there wasn't any people that could uh, uh, Zoom bomb and um, I would be able to record, pause the recording if I wanted to, uh, but I could very quickly sort of uh, switch between my, my uh, screen inputs. Uh, those of you that aren't familiar with, with Zoom, uh, when you click on share screen, you can very quickly see what you've got to, to bring into the, to the mainframe. Uh, and so for the most part in my asynchronous sessions, I was using uh, slides uh, complemented by different things that I was going to bring in through my iPad and also through my iPhone uh, as it was set up as a, as a visualizer. Um, and then obviously when you, you stop recording and you exit Zoom, it automatically completes the recording and exports it as an MP4. And with that raw video, either I could do a little bit of fine editing or I could just upload that straight onto the platform uh, where we were storing the videos for the students. Just to, just to show you, um, I've turned the sound off on this, but this was just to demonstrate that actually if you were doing something synchronously it doesn't uh, matter that there is that little bit of time between switching so I'm just showing here that through my webcam this is talking head I might introduce a session uh, with me being in full view uh, and then I might want to quickly bring up my slides uh, and you can do that really quickly um, so this is in kind of real time I could either keep my talking head here or I could turn it off um, talk through various slides and then if I wanted to start to describe or present something through a different uh, mode because it lent itself better to being presented uh, in that manner um, I could then link to for example my iPad uh, so a little bit further along um, I connect to to my iPad screen uh, these are the sorts of things that I'd be able to bring up on on my iPad which was a lot of these 3D models which um, were free to access so I could also ask the students to download these things and I can lifetime manipulate the the anatomy and allow them to appreciate these three-dimensional uh, relationships the other aspect to how I would bring my iPad into my uh, synchronous, uh, sorry, asynchronous recordings, but also um, something that can be used obviously in synchronous uh, uh, settings is that, you, as I've said, using the uh, iPad as, uh, as a whiteboard. Um, so what I use on my iPad, which was something I already had, which is uh, an app called Notability, um, which just, I think, 
gives you a, a greater functionality for, for using a whiteboard through your iPad versus the whiteboards that you get on Zoom or on, on Microsoft Teams. So here I would have something that I would uh, either annotate with the students if I was doing something synchronously, or actually the students would have the slides be watching a pre-recorded uh, tutorial and be able to draw along and annotate their slides with me. So this really helped with kind of keeping students engaged uh, with, uh, with, with, the, with the teaching uh, and the lectures. Then that the fourth sort of input that I would uh, would bring in, as, as I've said, is the visualizer. Um, so I could flip back to my uh, talking head, uh, bring up my slides very quickly again. Um, and if I just chivvy things along, um, this was me connecting now to my phone, my iPhone, which was already set up. Um, and now I'm using uh, my phone input, which is fully visible on the on the screen um, and I can demonstrate whatever it is that I wanted to demonstrate under the visualizer. In terms of setting up the visualizer, um, so I had the webcam for obviously my talking head input and I didn't want to buy another phone, uh, sorry, another another camera. Um, so I wanted to use my phone um, as the input, as the visualizer, but when I used the phone just as a camera, um, there was a few problems with that and I can show you on this video here is that if I just connected straight through my iPhone and access to the video or the photo, the frame was, was cropped, it was the size of my phone uh, and there wasn't sort of orientations I could change. I when I left. used the iDoc cam, Please, sir. Yep. Oh, when I used the iDoc cam, um, yeah. I could bring the image full screen, which is what I wanted. And this is just my setup with the phone on a stand. Uh, zoom in, zoom out. And the other aspect to that is um, th there was extra functionality on my phone so I could turn the light on if there was certain shadows over, over the models. So, so in summary, really, it was just to share a sort of practical uh, suggestion for uh, bringing in different sources of inputs cheaply, easily, um, using probably things that most people have um, and using software that is either free to access or, or very cheap um, and actually using this kind of multi input through Zoom on my laptop is perhaps something I might take into when I do return face to face and actually have my laptop set up to the projectors and again use the Zoom software to just almost quickly switch between different uh, different inputs. Um, so it might be something that plays into sort of my ongoing uh, teaching approaches. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of kind of it really. And I hope there's been some some something useful uh, for for people to perhaps think on or, or take away. Thank you, Lisa. And I think there's been lots of useful uh, useful tips and hints in there, actually. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Lisa? If you do, um, please just raise your hand and I will unmute you and you can ask Lisa a question. OK, we have one here. Um, apologies if I get this name wrong. Um, it's uh, Ereke, Erecti. That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I do apologize. Sorry. No, no problem. You can just call me ID. That's the first name. ID is OK. Um, so would you like to ask your question? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, thank you for that uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I tried something like that <laughs> during the lockdown, but my system was complaining of uh, having too much uh, resources. And uh, kind of giving me messages like uh, you have a low system kind of memory to run all the resources. So I don't know how you did use that. Uh, maybe you didn't get such a message. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, so just to clarify, was that that when you tried to bring in multiple resources previously into a session that there was some difficulties with bandwidth? No, not not the network bandwidth per se, but the memory of the computer. You know, I'm using a 16 gigabyte laptop, but I, I was so surprised that it was complaining of uh, the memory utilization because um, I, I was using drug cam and I used my phone as a camera and uh, I use four screens. And uh, yeah, I think I think with uh, and I'm not a computer. Uh, with by any means, but I think because with Zoom you're effectively sharing into a, one screen, I suppose, um, and then recording what's on that single screen. I, I I didn't have, I mean, I haven't got a particularly powerful laptop, but I didn't have any issues with 
it being able to switch and bring in different uh, inputs because they were primarily the tools be, were being run on other devices but all I was doing was was doing a screen share basically so it, I, I didn't fall into those sorts of uh, difficulties um, certainly not when I was doing the asynchronous recording. Okay. All right thank you. Thank you Lisa.